name is Roger Shock. I'm the pastor of this amazing congregation here at First United Methodist Church in Corinth, Mississippi. I want to welcome you to worship this morning. And thank you for watching on Channel 16 and on the internet. We hope and pray that your worship with us will be meaningful and that you will find and experience the presence of God even in these moments of worship together. May God bless us all as we worship Him today.
morning. My name is Roger Shock. I'm the pastor of this amazing congregation here at First United Methodist Church in Corinth, Mississippi. I want to welcome you to worship this morning and thank you for watching the Channel 16 and on the internet. We hope and pray that your worship with us will be meaningful and that you will find and experience the presence of God even in these moments of worship together. May God bless us all as we worship Him today. I just shocked the past this amazing congregation. We welcome each of you to worship this morning. It's always good to be in this place to worship our God. Uh, let me refer you to the bulletin for just a few moments for a couple of announcements. Uh, one is there's a very important uh, announcement about the nursery volunteer uh, needs. And uh, particularly on Wednesday nights between 5.30 and 6.30, we're needing uh, a volunteer or two to uh, help sit in the nursery and to take care of some of our children whose parents are participating in the Logos dinner time. So primarily from 5.30 to 6.30. And so if you're interested in that or available or feel the need, uh, the call to do that, please uh, let Haley know that. You can see her email address and her phone number is put in the bulletin. Uh, but we're uh, setting up a rotating uh, volunteer system for the, uh, uh, for the nursery along with uh, pursuing a, a staff person uh, in that position. So just know that that's the case. Uh, Monday night, there are two meetings here. Uh, lay leadership and nominated committee is meeting at 5.30. Uh, we will meet uh, upstairs in our regular, in the uh, conference room, if you will. And uh, the chapel committee is meeting at 5.15, and they'll meet in the chapel uh, tomorrow night. Important meetings for both of those. Uh, today in our worship, we begin the stewardship process. And uh, so we're doing that a little different this year. And so each week for the next four weeks, we'll have a stewardship speaker. And uh, so this morning, you see printing in your bulletin, Amanda Smith is going to uh, spend just a few moments talking about stewardship and talking about our congregation. And uh, so just know that when she comes up, uh, that is Amanda. And uh, we're so uh, pleased that she will be sharing this morning a little bit about stewardship with us. I also have a note from Dr. Sweat that uh, on Tuesday the 22nd, um, 11 to 1 at the Mississippi State Extension Center in Corinth, there'll be a uh, type 2 diabetes program. Uh, I think that's free, uh, but you do have to register so they'll have enough snacks and lunch or whatever provided for folks. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, please uh, let Dr. Sweat know and uh, he can get you registered for that program, but that's a really important uh, program and opportunity uh, for our community. Apparently, on Wednesday, I made the statement that uh, uh, Jesus would come back before Ole Miss beat Alabama and Tuscaloosa. <clears throat> so I want you to know that Jesus was in Tuscaloosa last night, and he is here with us today uh, in worship. So he's come back, apparently, and uh, so he's sitting amongst us somewhere. We just got to figure who it is. But uh, Jesus is apparently here because Ole Miss uh, won the football game last night. So I wanted to go on record since I made that statement the other day. Um, and I think I noticed that Spencer has something on his shirt. It says Jesus. No, that's Ole Miss. It's on his shirt right now. Uh, <laughs> who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? Uh, hopefully our folks from Ole Miss, uh, from Tuscaloosa, made it back last night. And uh, uh, what an interesting football weekend. My good friends, our worship of God is bigger than football. And this morning, we have the pleasure and the privilege of worshiping the living God. Let's prepare ourselves to do so, shall we?
challenged us to worship. Let us come together, all who know and love the living Lord. For God so loved each one of us that Christ died on our behalf. And Christ lives today and is with us wherever we might be. Let us open our hearts and let the Lord's love reign in us forever. And let our voices sing out with praise for God's mercy and grace. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We remain standing for opening him, hymn, hymn 128. He leadeth me, O bless his thought. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
to the lectern and share with us about stewardship. about what sets our church apart, what makes us different from other congregations. And the first thing I thought of was that we are a welcoming people. When Quentin and I first came to Corinth, we had the plan in our mind to visit four or five churches and see what was going on in Corinth, but that didn't happen because the first Sunday we came here, we were made to feel so welcome and invited to be a part of this family, we never went anywhere else. We came and went to choir practice and got involved, and the rest is history, and we have never even considered going anywhere else. And that is because our church is a family. We ha as I've gotten to know many of you, I've heard your stories about how you've been members of the choir since you were teenagers, and how you meet to pray and craft beautiful prayer shawls for our children and our young people and our young couples how you have made banners for our infants, and how you serve teaching Sunday school, or over in Little Blessings, or you know, with VBS and the like. And I've seen the outpouring of love that you show when the congregation, as a congregation, when others of our family are grieving, or celebrating, struggling, or excelling. And I've also experienced the fellowship and accountability provided in the Bible study that we have here. To be part of First United Methodist Church is to be part of a family. We may not always agree all the time like any family, but at the end of the day, our love for our great God and our love for each other bind us together inseparably. Our, his, our church also has a history of innovation. When given a choice to build a traditional, typical sanctuary or a different kind of sanctuary, our church chose to innovate. We chose to see the potential for community outreach and involvement and choose to build a space that said welcome this is for all of you. We want you to be a part of what we're doing here. And that vision continues into the future. We continue to innovate by bringing in new ministries and programs such as Logos and the community VBS, which has been a wonderful outreach, community Thanksgiving and others. But besides being an innovative church, we also have beautiful traditions that we honor. The way that we welcome infants in this church is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. It is precious. We show our love to them and I've had the privilege of attending a bee swarm or two, and I have to say I've never seen anything like that. That is such a unique ministry. It's a beautiful, active, vibrant ministry. Please keep doing what you're doing. It makes a big difference. Advent and Christmas here at First United Methodist are incredible. When we were here for our first Christmas this past year, we, we kind of wondered what it was going to be like since we'd never been here before for Christmas. And it was just so special from the hanging of the green and the Christmas caroling and and everything that we do to make, make it known here in our community that the light of the world has come. All of these things set First United Methodist apart, but what truly makes us special is you. All of these things wouldn't be possible without each one of you. Your love for Christ, your love for each other, and your love for our community make this church what it is. Our congregation is full of gifted, talented, and able people who all have a part in God's plan. Where is he calling you to serve? Many of you have partnered with us in Logos, and I have so much enjoyed getting to know you as a part of that. But there are so many other ministries in the church that need, need some work and need some help. Please consider speaking to someone in the office. If you have a gift that you'd like to share, we can find a place. <laughs> There's definitely something to be done. What has he given you that you can use to serve him? Being a part of First United Methodist for this past year has been a wonderful experience. It's being part of something amazing, a living and active body of Christ. I'm truly blessed to count my, myself among a part of a church family that honors its traditions while looking mindfully to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Come forward with the children's message.
Good morning. Boom, good job. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You like your little dog? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Put your dog. Be pretty. Take your hymnals and turn to him 405. We'll stand and sing, Seek Ye First. What have you been discussing most along life's ways? Have you invested in God's blessings, the, the blessings that God has poured out into your life? Giving increases your joy, even as our gifts minister to the needs of many. You're invited this morning to share in the ministry of giving and find God's joy. May God bless our offering this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated.
Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Listen or follow along to the word of our God. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another who, about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and served of all. Then he took a little child and he put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. The church is called to be about kingdom work. But what is kingdom work? What really is kingdom work? What does it look like? Uh, it, kingdom work, in my mind, and as I think about it, I ask that question of myself and as of, of the church today, uh, kingdom work seems so big and so overwhelming and so far out there and so far in the future that, that one day maybe the church will get to that. That's what I keep thinking about. What is kingdom work? But today's text out of uh, uh, Mark's Gospel it might give us a little bit of a clue about what kingdom work looks like as we look at uh, maybe some of what uh, Christ's expectation of his followers are 
and uh, maybe a little bit about what maybe kingdom work looks like if we look at our text today closely. In our text today, Jesus is traveling along with his disciples, teaching them for the second time uh, about the scriptures. And he's teaching them that the Son of Man will be betrayed, be handed over to, to, to humanity, uh, that, uh, and betrayed. He will be killed, and then he will rise again. Uh, he's teaching that to his disciples. His closest followers, those who, who are hanging on every word that he speaks, he's teaching them those words. But we know from the scriptures that we just read that the disciples didn't understand and uh, they didn't understand at all what Jesus was saying. And maybe it's because uh, uh, they were distracted, if you will, but, uh, but they didn't understand and they were afraid to ask a question for clarification. So when they arrived in Capernaum, uh, Jesus, uh, who knows everything, notices that the disciples are having a conversation along the way with themselves uh, he asked the disciples, what were you talking about on the way? More specifically in the scriptures, he says, what were you arguing about along the way? Think about this. Jesus is teaching his closest followers, those that, that uh, uh, like I said, were hanging on every word, teaching about his betrayal and about him being killed and about uh, him coming back to life. And his closest followers are arguing as they walk along with him. They're distracted. They're distracted by their, by their own thoughts and maybe their own agendas. Do we ever get distracted from doing kingdom work in the church? Do we ever miss the message of the Lord because we're distracted by our own thoughts and by our own agendas? When Jesus asked him what they were arguing about, the disciples just stood there in silence. They were speechless. They had no response to Jesus' question, uh, maybe because uh, they hoped that Jesus uh, didn't know what they were talking about. Maybe they uh, were speechless because uh, they realized how selfish their argument was. Mark's Gospel tells us that the disciples were arguing about who among them is the greatest? What a great question. A question that we ask ourselves that all the time because you, like me, or me, like you, when I look into the mirror, I see the greatest. And most of us are thinking the same thing. You're looking at yourself thinking, well, I'm the greatest. That's the great question. Who is the greatest among us? You know, maybe the disciples were, were arguing about this, who was the greatest among them, because uh, uh, they, were, they were coming from the agenda of, okay, which one of us is going to be in charge when this Jesus guy is taken out? Maybe they, were, maybe they were thinking about this, who's the greatest among us, and having this conversation because they were thinking about, okay, which one of us are others going to follow after Jesus is gone? And Jesus, knowing all things, he gets to the heart of the matter with his disciples and, and, and he, he sits them down, he calls them together, and he, uh, he begins to continue to teach them. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Do you realize that even in Jesus' day, the kingdom of God looked very different than everyday society? Even in Jesus' day. Even then, the power and the leadership uh, was played out uh, within this structure of uh, whoever is first or whoever's in charge is the most important, just like it is today. The first should be last and servant of all. That's that kingdom of God uh, transformation of the world that, uh, uh, that Jesus is talking about. Uh, Jesus transformed that, that thought of being first and the strongest and the one who is in charge by saying to his disciples, whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Today's world, servants are not very important, or at least they're not, uh, not viewed as very important. Now, they're important because they do things for us. 
But in the pecking order of, of importance, uh, they play a support role for those of us who are important. They're viewed as this, this lower position in, uh, uh, in the pecking order of life. And Jesus says, the greatest among you must be the servant. So I wonder, who is great among us? Who is the servant among us in this church? Who is the, who's the one who does the dirty work? Who's the one who, who, uh, uh, who does the non-glamorous work in this church? Who's the one who does the uh, behind-the-scenes work in this church? I like what Katie said a minute ago. Who's the one at the back of the line who closes the door after everybody's gone? Hadn't thought of it that way. Who's at the back of the line in this church? Jesus would say that that person or those people are the greatest among us. And just to put an exclamation point on the, on the who's the greatest issue, uh, Jesus continued his teaching and he, and he takes a little child and he puts it in the midst of these 12. And, and I can only imagine that the disciples are sitting around doing what disciples do, sitting in their assigned seats like we do oftentimes in committee meetings. And uh, there's this little child just standing there. And I suspect they let this child stand there for a while. And they're just looking at Jesus going, okay, get to the point, Jesus. Why is this little child standing in front of us? And then Jesus probably motions the child to come over and he, and he takes that child and he holds him in his arms. And he says to his disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It's been said that to welcome a child is to extend the simplest act to an individual uh, that society dismisses as, as just a cute gesture. A child, a cute gesture to a child that is really kind of insignificant in the world. Someone who lacks any accomplishment, somebody who lacks any greatness, somebody who lacks any status. To welcome a child in this world is to is to is a cute gesture that we do for our children. But to welcome a child in Jesus' day was counterculture. That was a big deal. For you see, a child came from its mother who was viewed as property in those days. And the child was an extension uh, of the mother. And a, and, a, and, a, and a woman had very little value other than property. They had very little worth in Jesus' day. And this child, all children, were an extension of their mother. And they were viewed as not very valuable, not very worthy. So to welcome a child was, to, uh, was not to be viewed as a powerful thing or an action that leads anyone to greatness in society. Today is somewhat similar. To serve a child, to teach a child, to be a teacher, to be a child care worker is paid much less than many, many, many other jobs in our society because it's not viewed as a great powerful position. And yet, teachers, you teachers and you child care workers shape and mold a child. Today's world, we love our children, but you know, children aren't invited into the boardroom. We love our children, but they're not invited into the decision process of, of uh, making uh, uh, decisions about life. They aren't respected in ways that, that lead us to listen to a child in regards to, to how or what we do things or we do things in the world. We adults rely upon our own power. We rely upon our own agendas. We rely upon, we rely upon our own greatness over and above a child. When push comes to shove, a little child is, is more often lost in the issues of business decisions and powerful adult agendas. And yet Jesus very intentionally 
held a little child in the middle of his closest followers and told them that the greatest among them was the one who welcomed a child. Could it be that among lots of the activities for children and the ministry to children is maybe one of the most significant things that happen in the building up of the kingdom of God in this world? Could it be that those who serve little children are actually greater than those who sit in the rooms and discuss the ministries of little children? The difficult place that we find ourselves today is that many of us, including myself, have found ourselves distracted by the agendas of budgets, finances, and what we like and don't like regarding the ministries of children within our congregation, within this ministry we call little blessings. And in our distractions, could it be that we have failed to see the kingdom of God, the work of the kingdom of God that is happening as some servants, as some child care workers, some child care givers have done this amazing task of welcoming little children on a daily basis? Could it be that those of us, including myself, have thought, that, have thought of ourselves as the greatest because we've got these great ideas as to how we ought to do little blessings or, 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 or why we should do little blessings or why we shouldn't do little blessings? Could it be that the one thing, uh, that one of the best things that this church does in regards to, to uh, welcoming Christ on a daily basis is found in that everyday reality when children are welcomed in the name of faith on our behalf as a congregation? Could it be that one of the best things we do is love a child? that needs to be loved on a daily basis. Maybe we're doing more kingdom work around here than we realize. Maybe we're doing more kingdom work around here than we give ourselves credit for. Maybe we're doing kingdom work in spite of ourselves. Maybe kingdom work is happening in the amazing presence of God is being experienced every day in this sacred place that we call the church. Jesus once held a little child and said to his followers, whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. May we never stop working May we never stop doing whatever it takes to welcome any and all little children that come our way. That the kingdom of God might be experienced in us and through us in the world. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be great as we struggle to be servants of all. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is God Will Take Care of You. Hymn number 130, verses 1, 2, and 4. Lord, come and take care of us as we stand and sing.
happy to be a part of a congregation that struggles to welcome little children. For if we weren't living the struggle, we would be a dead church. But because we're in the struggle, to be the church and to be a faithful church and to do whatever it is God wants us to do, we are uh, on the right track. And every day, more life is being pumped into this place because our God is helping us and our God is with us. That's exciting for a pastor. So the struggle is not the problem. I'd be more upset and more disturbed if we didn't have the struggle. But we are struggling to be God's people. And there's hope when that's the case. So thank you. Before the benediction, there is an orange purse that someone left in the North X that somebody probably needs to go home. Uh, I'm sure the ushers have taken all your money, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> but your purse is in the back, so they, uh, uh, and Thad is the one who had it, so blame him. But, the, uh, so, but please take your uh, stuff, and then the last one here, whoever is the greatest, lock the doors when we all go, okay? Would somebody do that? <laughs> Whoever that is. So tonight, today, Ken, because I know you lock the doors more often than not. <laughs> today, there'll be like 47 people going, would y'all just leave so we can lock the doors? <laughs> My friends, would you see this benediction? Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of community of the Holy Spirit abide in each of you now and forever. Amen.